Good morning and welcome to the historic Lindsley Avenue Church of Christ message. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and to invest in God's Word this morning. We're going to be reading from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and following. I want to begin by inviting you to an exciting event we're having at the church virtually. We're going to have a virtual tour of the church building on May 7th at 8 a.m. That's this coming Wednesday at 8 a.m. And we want to show you the beautiful building, the work that has happened there over the last five or six years, and invite you to continue that project uh, by donating to the church on that day, May 7th, at 8 a.m. We will have a virtual tour of the church. Thank you for your past support, and we look forward to showcasing the beautiful work that has been done in the beautiful historic Lindsley Avenue Church, which, as many of you know, is on the National Historic Registry. And so we're excited about that event, and we want you to, to be a part of that Wednesday at 8 a.m. We're talking about salvation, and we're in our third part in this series about salvation. We've talked about many different things, and I hope that it has expanded and encouraged and edified you in your understanding of what God has done. The psalmist of old says, The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. And so as we have discussed the different aspects of salvation through these different words that God has given us, I hope that it has exalted our God in our hearts and in our minds. And so we have discussed justification, which justification is this idea of justice and legality, and how can a sinner stand before a righteous God? How can we be made right with God, with rightness itself? Uh, because all goodness comes from God. And of course, all of these avenues of salvation come to a point in Jesus, in his ministry, in his life, and in his death, and in his resurrection. We also talked about redemption, which, which gets to the idea of value, that God has redeemed us. He's purchased us through the blood of Christ. And not only that, it gets to the ideas of subservience, that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we have been freed and emancipated through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so today, we're going to get into the subject of reconciliation. And this gets to the idea of relationship. That what we have with God is more than just the outward signs and showings of a religion, but it is a relationship, a personal relationship with God. And of course, Jesus taught this. When Jesus talked about who we are in relation to God, he was talking about the greatest commandments. What is my obligation to God? And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, 37 and following, the greatest commandment is thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And so reconciliation has to do with this relational component to our lives with the living God. And experiencing salvation is restoring that relationship. Relationships are important to us, aren't they? They're so important. Relationships are what make life filled with meaning and purpose, and it's, it's really what life is about, isn't it? But with relationships come challenges, don't they? No matter what relationship that we're talking about, we could go to the first type of relationship, which would probably be family. 
And some of the people that we may have the most challenges with are people in our own family, right? I think it was George Burns who said one time, happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. Why? Because those relationships can be challenging and difficult. We think about the relationships of romance and marriage. Can marriage be challenging? I'm reminded sometimes of that saying, never laugh at your wife's decisions because you were one of them. And so romance, marriage can be very challenging at times, can it? What about our professional lives? It seems to be kind of a universal thing in a lot of the jobs that I've held in life that if you go around the water cooler and you hang out long enough, you'll find where staff members are confessing the sins of the boss, right? Because those relationships can be very challenging, can't they? Or what about friendship? I think it was... Uh, Groucho Marx, who said, when you're in jail, a good friend will be trying to bail you out. A best friend will be in the cell next to you saying, wow, that was fun. All of those relationships have great, great rewards. But they also have great challenges. Reconciliation is about relationships being restored and being made right. I'm reminded of a story that Ernest Hemingway wrote called The Capital of the World. And the story is about a boy, a young man named Paco, which was a very, uh, a name that was used a lot in Spain and Paco desires to be a matador and so he also desires to be out of his father's control and he runs away from home and he runs to the capital he runs to the city he goes to Madrid Spain and his father is heartbroken and his father travels to Madrid and he puts an ad in the newspaper and it says, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the Madrid newspaper tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. And Hemingway wrote, The next day at noon, in front of the newspaper office, there were 800 Pacos, all seeking forgiveness from their father. All of our relationships have probably known some sort of reconciliation, haven't they? Where there were times where we needed reconciliation in that relationship. Our relationship with God has to be according to the truth. And there's two ideas that we have to balance when we are discussing the relationship that we have with God and who God is. The first thing that we have to understand on who God is is that He is above me, that He has authority, that He is sovereign. And the Bible describes God's sovereignty as one as a creator. Romans 9, 20, O oh man, who are you to reply to God, will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me thus? Does not the potter have power over the clay? So when I begin to understand who God is, I have to understand that he is above me, that I am obligated to him. There's other descriptions of God in Scripture where it describes God as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, that I look to God for my guidance, for my direction, for my safety. 
God's also been described as king, for God is the king over all the earth. And God has also been described as a parent. Hebrews chapter 12, 6, the Lord loves whom he chastens, whom he disciplines. And so when I think about this relationship that I have with God, I have to understand that I answer to God, that God is in authority over me, but also this relationship comes with love, that God is also described in James 2.23 as a friend. God is also described as a spouse. Remember in Ephesians chapter 5.22, describing that relationship of a husband to his wife. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Amidst all of our relationships, we have all experienced some sort of separation. Some sort of estrangement, haven't we? Some type of departure in that relationship. Relationships can have relational distance, can't they? When intimacy is interrupted, and when we observe and when we look at our relationship with God, we always come to the conclusion that it is us who walk away from God, that we withdraw ourselves from His presence. The first idea that we have to think about with reconciliation is, number one, the estrangement from God. That in our relationships with God, we can become estranged and we do become estranged because of sin. Back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 8, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. Their first reaction after sinning against God was to physically remove themselves, to hide themselves from God, to flee from His presence. There was that separation, wasn't there? Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Paul talked about in Galatians 5, You have become estranged from Christ. Sin creates a chasm. Sin creates a separation. Not only does sin separate us, but it also makes us oppositional to who God is. That's why in Romans chapter 5:10 it says, "We were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. So not only have we withdrawn from God, not only have we separated ourselves from God, but in that absence, in that separation, we have become oppositional to His will because of sin. And what do we try to do? We try to fill that voidness that belongs to God with other things. The great philosopher Pascal said it like this, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. When we are separated from God, there's no other relationship that will satisfy that voidness, that absence. Sin separates us from the living God. Not only does it separate us from God, but it separates who we are meant to be. That our actual identity is in Christ. And the longer we are separated from God the more incongruent our lives will become because we're not living out the true identity of who God desires us to be. And we also see that sin not only separates us from God, not only separates us from ourselves, but it separates us from other people, those relationships that we have on earth. 
Ephesians chapter 2, 14 and following talks about how the early church was bringing people together that had been apart, who had never been together, in fact. It was breaking down the walls of partition that were between relationships and people. Christ brings us together. You know, you think about the holidays. And you think about when people come together for the holidays. I know in my own family, a lot of times it's returning home to my mother's house. And as different people in the family from different places from all over begin to move towards that house, that home, we come together because we have a central point of unity that brings us together, that as we get closer to God, we get closer to each other. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And as a result, sin no longer has that power of separation in these relationships. There was this estrangement with God, and then there is this engagement of God through Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and following. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Because all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So even though we were estranged from God, the estrangement from God, God engages us through Jesus Christ. And that gets us to the identity of who is Jesus. Who is Jesus? And this really matters because he is the only one capable of building that bridge from heaven to earth. Because who is Jesus? And the Bible gives us this startling claim that Jesus is the Word, eternal Word with God and was God, made flesh. That in the person of Jesus, you have quite literally the reconciliation of humanity and God in one person. So Jesus is capable of bridging that divide between humanity and God himself. And this was accomplished through his sacrifice. Listen to the words. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them and having committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul gives us this picture that God has reconciled us through Christ, that Christ has become sin for us, that Christ knows the withdrawal of the fellowship with God. Christ knows that because of our sins. It says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And of course, when Jesus was on the cross in Matthew chapter 27, 64, we see that estrangement played out where Christ echoes the words of Psalms 22, verse 1, where he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment on the cross, Christ experienced the great chasm, the great divide, the great destruction of that relationship that happens in sin. But it was through that that Christ restores our righteousness because he has taken our place. And as a result, because there is this estrangement from God, there becomes this engagement by God, which creates the rearrangement of God, verse 17. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. God is creating a new reality in Jesus. It's a new reconciliation that we know through him. And we have to live our lives according to this new rearrangement, this reconciliation. Remember that one of the parables of Jesus is a story of reconciliation. The story of the lost son, the prodigal son, where the son takes his inheritance and leaves his father. He goes into a far country and he squanders his living on riotous living. And then he remembers that even servants have it better than he has it now. And there he was in a pigsty. And it says that he came to his senses and he returns home. And it says, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, reconciled. And so we become ambassadors of this rearrangement that God has given us, this reconciliation. That means we live our lives differently. That when we are at the altar of worship, it says in Matthew chapter 5, and we remember that we have a relationship problem with a brother or someone we love, that we leave the gift at the altar and we get ourselves right first with our brother or sister, then return to the altar to worship God. We become ambassadors of that reconciliation. We begin to live that out. You know, when we think about this world and we think about the many issues and problems that this world has, one of the greatest issues is that of forgiveness, isn't it? It seems we have lost knowledge of the ability of for, to forgive. And isn't that the prayer of Christ? Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. Learning forgiveness which is ultimately reconciliation. And it's also we are ambassadors of reconciliation by providing the gospel. He says in verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled unto God. And so, as agents of reconciliation, not only are we living out our lives differently by forgiveness and by getting right with one another, but we're also showing people the enormity of the gospel that God is forgiving us, reconciling us through Jesus. I'm reminded of the words of a great philosopher who said, he who has not God in himself cannot feel his absence. So if you do know the absence of God, if you do feel that you have withdrawn from God, that means you have known him. You have felt his presence and there is a desire to be reconciled with him. And you can be. This week was the anniversary of my father's passing. As a part of that, my family and I went to my father's grave and spent time there together, reminiscing and celebrating his life. And as I thought about my lesson for you today and in my life, and as I stood at his grave, it occurred to me that even though now he has passed on and he has removed from me a distance that will not be removed in this lifetime, a great distance, a heartbreaking distance, that when I begin to look over my life and I survey my life, there was something more heartbreaking that there were times in my life to where I was actually more estranged from my father than at that moment at the grave. 
There were times in my life that I was present with my father physically, but I was spiritually removed to another country, to another value, to another life. And even though I shed tears of remorse in the loss of my father and in his gain, I rejoiced that I had been reconciled with him because even though he is removed from me physically, I'm closer to my father than I've ever been. So I guess my name is Paco too. And in a sense, all of us are named Paco because we have separated ourselves from our Heavenly Father. And then the greatest gift is this, is that the greatest reconciliation is yet to come with our Heavenly Father and with those we love. But we have to acquiesce to the will of God. We have to respond to His love. We have to respond to the ad in the paper, which is through Jesus Christ. All is forgiven through Christ. If we will turn to Him in faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, and it's through the obedience of the gospel that we place our faith in the gospel message. That gospel message is what a part of what we do as Christians every Sunday when we partake of communion because we remember how God has reconciled us in Jesus. We partake of the bread which represents his body. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for this bread which represents the perfect life of Jesus. Help us to take it in a way and manner which is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We take of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Christ, which was shed for us. Father God, thank you for this cup which represents the very blood of Jesus that cleanses us, which redeems us, which justifies, justifies us, which reconciles us to you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today and experiencing the wonderful work of salvation in Jesus, the reconciliation, the making right of this relationship that we have in God. If you have any questions, feel free to message me about salvation or about the church, and we look forward to seeing you on May 7th at 8 a.m. for a beautiful tour of the church. God bless you and have a great week.